Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first Millbank Tweed Forum of this school year. On behalf of Millbank Tweed Forum and the Program on Corporate Compliance and Enforcement, I'd like to welcome you guys all here today for Red Card for FIFA, Inside the Case Against Global Soccer. A word first about uh, the Millbank Forum. Uh, thanks to sponsorship by Millbank Tweed Hadley McCloy, uh, of New York. We have this forum every week so that the students can come and listen to um, some of the legal issues that are front and center in the world and, and speak to a panel of experts like these individuals here um, on the issues that are most exciting and that are going on uh, right now that may interest the students. Um, we are the program on corporate compliance and enforcement co-hosting this today. Uh, faculty Director Jennifer Arlen is here with us today in the front. Uh, faculty Director Jeffrey Miller um, hopefully will be here shortly. I'm Serena Vash. I'm the Executive Director of the Program on Corporate Compliance and Enforcement. We are a law and policy institute that looks to determine what are the causes of corporate crime and how do we affect policy and compliance efforts uh, in corporations to keep those crimes from occurring. Today, we are hearing from a panel of experts on the indictment of the FIFA indictment that came out on May 27th, 2015. On May 27th of this year, Attorney General Loretta Lynch, newly minted Attorney General Loretta Lynch, announced a sweeping indictment against 14 individuals, 47 counts, 162 pages, against 14 individuals, nine officials of World Cup soccer, uh, and n five individuals who are um, sports marketing executives who obtain lucrative media and marketing rights to the world's most sought after soccer tournaments. Of the 14 individuals that were indicted, multiple were high-ranking officials of FIFA, the international organization responsible for promoting and regulating international soccer. Others were leaders of the regional governing bodies under FIFA's umbrella. And as I mentioned, five others were sports marketing officials who paid millions and millions of dollars of bribes and kickbacks, allegedly, in order to uh, line their own pockets and uh, for their own commercial gain. With us today, I am pleased to introduce from my left, Ms. Antonia Apps. She is a partner with Millbank Tweed Hadley McCloy. She was formerly with the Southern District of New York, a prosecutor with the Southern District of New York, who was the lead prosecutor on the SAC Capital case. Directly to my left, Marshall Miller, who is now a senior fellow at the Program on Corporate Compliance and Enforcement, and is the former Principal Deputy Attorney General and Chief of Staff of the Department of Justice. He was also formerly involved as a supervisor on this FIFA indictment, and so we will be asking him questions that are uh, mostly grounded in the law and not grounded in the facts specifically of this case. Directly to my right, Mark Agnifilo, Senior Trial Counsel, Braffman and Associates. Uh, he is also a former Assistant United States Attorney from the District of New Jersey, and he was the lead prosecutor in the racketeering case against Robert Lee, the President of the International Boxing Federation. And to my far right, Grant Wall, senior writer from Sports Illustrated. Grant is one of the world's leading soccer journalists and has covered eight World Cups and four Olympics, and he's the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Beckham Experiment. So go out and get it. Grant, I'm gonna start with you, and I'm gonna ask you to uh, tell our audience um, the history of the corruption allegations in FIFA and what are the facts that led to this case? So I've been covering soccer at Sports Illustrated since 1996. Um, and over the years, certainly there have been plenty of allegations out there that FIFA was dirty, basically, that um, uh, things were going on in FIFA that involved bribery, whether it came to uh, the, how tournaments were awarded to host countries uh, or television contracts. A lot of times this, these allegations happening not so much at FIFA itself in Switzerland, but in these regional confederations. So FIFA is made up of different, basically continental regions 
Uh, the one here in this region is called CONCACAF, North and, South, or North and Central America and the Caribbean. Uh, South America is called CONMEBOL. Um, Europe is UEFA and so on and so forth. Um, and it sort of all crystallized, I think, in December of 2010. I remember this December 2nd, it was my birthday. Um, in Zurich, Switzerland, when the host countries for World Cups 2018 and 22 were announced and the votes were taking place on the FIFA Executive Committee that day. And Russia won the right to host 2018, Qatar won the right to host 22 over the US in the final round. And I was there, I was in the hotel where all these arrests were later made, uh, where all these FIFA officials were, it felt shady, the whole thing. And not just because the US lost, uh, but because uh, it, it felt like these were bought, basically. And over the years, FIFA and these regional confederations have had their own investigations, but none of them had subpoena power. And as you might expect, they never really turned up a heck of a lot. And so in late 2011, we started hearing, seeing media reports that there was an actual FBI investigation going on into people connected to FIFA and these regional confederations. And we would occasionally see these reports for a couple of years to the point where in early 2015, I remember talking about this uh, in a public forum and, and kind of wondering when were we going to see something happening as a result. And on the morning of May 27th this year uh, in Zurich, uh, I guess it was around midnight our time, 6 a.m. their time. Um, these arrests took place. And these were not the highest officials at FIFA, but they were significant officials in some case. So it wasn't Seth Blatter, the FIFA president. All, but all these, it made sense, the, the timing, because all of these uh, soccer politicians who had their national federations were coming to Zurich for the FIFA presidential election and they were all there, and um, I just remember the excitement that day of these arrests taking place, and it, they were officials like uh, Jeffrey Webb, who was a, a vice president at FIFA, the head of CONCACAF, this region, who would come in as this guy who was supposed to clean things up. Um, it was uh, other guys, uh, like, you know, one of the indictments was Jack Warner, who was, uh, previously the president of CONCACAF and the third most powerful person at FIFA. Um, so these were significant individuals and th there were also these sports marketing executives, including some who had already pled guilty, like Chuck Blazer, the former general secretary of CONCACAF, uh, and Jose Javila, the Brazilian sports marketing head of traffic. Um, so this was uh, a huge moment because suddenly you had the United States government with subpoena power going after these guys, and I think maybe the US government investigation is about the only thing that these guys would fear because they never have had reason to fear getting in the situation with before. Thanks very much. Um, Marshall, can you talk a little bit about some of the, there's a number of schemes that are charged in the indictment. Let's make sure that's on, okay. Can you talk a little about, bit about some of the schemes that are charged in the indictment um, and the allegations of, of what happened in the course of those schemes? Sure. Um, I think the first way to look at it is to think a little bit about what these executives who have been charged with criminal activity um, allegedly were able to control. Um, they were able to control, as Grant talked about, the location of tournaments. Um, they were also able to control uh, in their positions of leadership, uh, either at FIFA or at the regional confederation level, or even uh, the member country level, they were able, able to control the marketing rights for these tournaments. And as the World Cup uh, and some of the more regional tournaments, the Copa America, the Gold Cup, other, other uh, regional tournaments gained uh, fans, gained uh, worldwide uh, excitement and interest, the ability to market based on either the TV rights uh, to those uh, cups and tournaments or potentially uh, t-shirts and other paraphernalia associated with those um, tournaments uh, took on huge, um, it was just an incredibly profitable enterprise. Uh, and they essentially controlled who could uh, monopolize or monetize, I should say, those rights. 
Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a powerful position. Uh, it's a position uh, that commands a huge amount of profit. Um, and there really was very little oversight, if any oversight at all, uh, as to how they exercised those rights, how they delivered those rights to companies like marketing companies, sports marketing companies. Um, and there was, now, there was very little oversight, very little transparency. This is all allegations uh, from the indictment. Um, uh, so there's allegedly little oversight, little transparency, and little ability to judge why uh, a tournament uh, marketing rights were given to one company over another, or a tournament was awarded to one country or another. Um, so that's the backdrop um, for the allegations in the indictment. And essentially what the uh, indictment does is it describes an overall scheme, an overall scheme to monopolize or monetize power uh, at FIFA and the regional confederations um, and to use it to command huge amounts, allegedly, of uh, bribes and kickbacks uh, to distribute those rights. Um, so then the, the indictment breaks down the different schemes, and the schemes basically relate primarily to uh, the marketing rights for tournaments, uh, tournaments uh, in South America, the United States, uh, the, the North American region, as well as the World Cup. Um, in addition, and, and so that's why you see the indictment uh, charge uh, both FIFA and, and regional confederation officials um, and also sports marketing executives, as Serena said, because the sports marketing executives in most of the uh, marketing rights charges, the schemes relating to the marketing rights, are bribing the, allegedly bribing the officials. Um, it gets a little more complicated. You have a different set of actors uh, in the couple of schemes that relate to the siting of tournaments. Um, there, there's allegations. Uh, and, and also to the election of officials. There's, a, there's one scheme that talks about bribing uh, those folks uh, at the uh, member country level um, who elect representatives who, to be on the FIFA executive committee and head up the confederations. Um, as you can see, uh, based on the allegations in the indictment, um, those positions can be lucrative if you're willing to take kickbacks and bribes. Uh, and so uh, there were also bribe schemes relating to getting into one of those positions, that is bribing the folks who had votes to elect the people who have those positions. So that's a sort of an overview of the schemes. They're charged in different ways. There's an overarching racketeering charge, just uh, alleging that this group of 14 uh, individuals, along with co-conspirators who are described but not named, um, allegedly uh, essentially corrupted FIFA uh, an originally legitimate enterprise um, and took advantage of it to um, engage in racketeering and also various charges relating to wire fraud, uh, that is um, engaging in fraud using uh, electronic wires, uh, either telephone calls or wired um, transaction, uh, fund transactions, um, as well as money laundering charges uh, and a couple of assorted uh, obstruction and tax charges as well. Uh, and just to go back to some of the schemes, one of the schemes was also um, the 2010 World Cup scheme that was awarded to South Africa, is that right? Yes, that is uh, um, among the schemes. Uh, there, is, there are allegations and there's a, uh, charges relating to the awarding of the 2010 World Cup to South Africa. But as respects this indictment, the one that was unveiled um, May 27, 2015, this indictment does not include allegations with respect to the 2018 and the 2022 World Cups. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. That there are no allegations in this indictment as to those the wording of those tournaments. Um, uh, I believe at the press conference where uh, the attorney general announced uh, these charges uh, and a um, information that's come out of um, from authorities in Switzerland uh, have announced that folks in Switzerland are investigating the awarding of those games. Um, as many of you may know, uh, FIFA, its principal headquarters is in Zurich, Switzerland. That's why, uh, as Grant described, um, the arrests took place there at one of the key meetings of uh, FIFA leaders. Thank you. I don't know if you can tell, I'm a former, um, a former trial attorney, so I feel like I just cross-examined uh, Marshall Miller. Is that correct? Um, count one. Mark Agnifilo, former prosecutor in the District of New Jersey, count one is uh, racketeering. As Marshall said, the overarching racketeering conspiracy. Can you talk a little bit about um, racketeering and what's required to prove racketeering and talk a little bit about the, the enterprise and how it's uh, stated in the indictment here? Sure. Um, 
when you say racketeering, it's a reference to the RICO charge. RICO stands for the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organization Statute. It was passed by Congress in 1970. It was passed primarily, uh, although not exclusively, as a way of the federal government prosecuting Italian organized crime, uh, which at the time was much worse than it is today. Some people would say part of the reason we got our hands around Italian organized crime is because of the RICO statute and other statutes. The idea really is to, to view a case completely uh, differently than you could without RICO. Uh, Marshall made reference to the fact that the indictment talks about all these different schemes, and I think there's 12 schemes, although my strong suit isn't counting, um, but I think it's 12 schemes in the indictment. Without RICO, you may have to charge each of those schemes independently as a, as a wire fraud scheme, a conspiracy to commit wire fraud, something like that. What RICO essentially lets you do is it lets you take diverse uh, criminal charges and combine them together in one charging document so long as all of the charges are committed by people who are part of an enterprise. That's the key. And so you'll see the term enterprise. What's an enterprise? An enterprise isn't really all that much. An enterprise is essentially a structured group, uh, a group with some structure for the making of decisions, a group with some semblance of longevity, um, some continuity of personnel, but it doesn't have to be you know, completely continuous. People can come and go. It's, it's a very elastic concept, truthfully, and it's, and it's gotten more elastic in the last few years with a recent Supreme Court decision called Boyle. Um, but it was always elastic, and it's really a way of a prosecutor taking a set of facts and saying, I want to tell the entire story of all of these people and of all of these events. What is going to let me tell the entire story beginning to end? And the RICO statute lets you do that. The RICO statute lets you say, okay, what's my enterprise going to be? And in this case, the enterprise is FIFA and the six um, constituent, you know, sort of sub-members. But they're not saying that those were the criminal organizations. Those are legitimate organizations. I think FIFA is over 100 years old that were essentially commandeered, corrupted by the defendants and others. And so the legitimate structure of FIFA basically satisfies the structure element of the enterprise. So you have an enterprise, which is a, a structured group, and then the members of the enterprise have to commit um, two pattern acts as part of their membership uh, in the enterprise. And with RICO conspiracy, there's no substantive RICO charge. There's no, no 1962C, which is substantive RICO. They charge 1962D, which is RICO conspiracy. The, one of the differences in one of the, and this is something that I would not, not have seen 10 years ago. They, they, they just started charging RICO conspiracies now, um, whereas we, when I was a prosecutor way back when, um, we would have to charge C and D. With C, which they didn't charge, you have to actually enumerate the predicate acts that are part of the RICO charge. Here they don't. And so what the indictment basically says is that there's a racketeering conspiracy. These people all agreed to basically corrupt FIFA and run it as a criminal organization. And part and parcel of them doing that is they committed a number of pattern acts. And the pattern acts are wire fraud, um, bribery under New York state law, um, something called interna uh, interstate travel and aid of racketeering, and there are a number of, of categories of charges listed. So the beauty of the RICO statute, and you really see it here, is an incredibly long, complicated, diverse story like the corruption of FIFA can all be told literally in one single count, uh, which is why I think they did it the way they did it. Can you, can you talk for a second also about um, the statute of limitations issues that, that um, the racketeering statute enables you to work with, yes. if you will? Yes, of course. Um, if you look at the enterprise count, the enterprise, I think, starts in 1991 and goes to the present. Most criminal statutes have a five-year statute of limitations, not all, but most. You can't go back further than five years. RICO lets you go back to the um, creation of the statute in November of 1970. And so long as every racketeering act is within 10 years of every other racketeering act, and so long as there's um, essentially sort of continuity um, in, in the racketeering acts, you can go back literally till November of 1970, and that becomes your statute of limitations. You don't have a statute of limitations issue because the enterprise 
basically committed crimes throughout this period of time. So you can go back 30 or 40 years. So just briefly, Antonia, if you could talk a little bit about um, uh, why, why the charges here, why racketeering, uh, wire fraud, uh, money laundering, and not, for example, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, you know, why not FCPA, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act? So the gist of an FCPA charge is the bribery of a foreign official. So in other words, the FCPA prohibits a US entity or in some cases a foreign entity or people acting on behalf of a foreign entity from pay making a corrupt payment or promise to make a corrupt payment to a foreign official. And as far as you can tell, based on the allegations in the indictment, there were no payments to foreign officials. Now, of course, we don't know everything in the world there is to know about the investigation, but based on the allegations in the indictment, you don't satisfy that basic element of FCPA liability. And in fact, uh, in perhaps one of the more dramatic uh, stories in the indictment, there's actually payments the other way from um, South African government, essentially, uh, to I individuals um, and not the payment to the, the foreign official. So that really knocks F the FCPA out based on the allegations in the indictment. But you can still move on with, as you know, Mark's already talked extensively about RICO and money laundering, um, which is a, a very flexible statute to charge under when you have you know, acts of concealment or promoting or furthering the unlawful activity, here the bribes and so forth. So uh, that's uh, presumably why they proceeded in the fashion that they proceeded so far. Um, one, one thing I think is interesting about that is the idea of the FCPA, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, is to curb international corruption, and it's uh, one, the U.S.'s effort, and there are other countries that are also engaged in this same effort uh, to work together to combat international corruption through bringing these kinds of cases. And I think what's interesting about this problem that uh, a body like FIFA um, potentially is not chargeable under uh, the FCPA because of what Antonia said, that is because its officials don't meet the definition of foreign official under the FCPA, is you have these very powerful international organizations that uh, engage in activity that is uh, almost at the level in terms of its effect of a nation state. Um, but their leadership, um, because it doesn't fit under the FCPA, uh, potentially could skirt um, the boundaries of that statute and the, F and the international corruption efforts to uh, combat um, corruption. So I think, um, uh, what's in, you know, I think what you see in this indictment, uh, one way to look at it is the uh, use of U.S. laws to address that problem, right. um, uh, that a gap. Yeah. So Grant, if I can go back to you, um, how did this investigation start? So my understanding is Chuck Blazer, this American who lived in New York, still lives in New York, uh, was the general secretary of CONCACAF uh, for many years, um, uh, was approached and and was was told look you know we have all this on you and you can cooperate with us uh or you can you know you'll end up going to jail now um you know chuck blazer is a very colorful character as are some of the several of the people involved in this case he's for one thing he, weigh, he almost weighs 400 pounds he uh is a very much a nightlife guy. He ha had a table at Elaine's in New York. Um, he has a long history going back to the 70s of developing the smiley face button. He is a big character. He's um, a Falstaffian is the, the term often used to describe him. And he figured out how to make a lot of money and had it written into his contract, according to him, that he uh, his nickname became Mr. 10%, that he got 10% of every deal that CONCACAF did. And he and Jack Warner took over CONCACAF long, long ago. I forget the year, but it was early 90s, maybe? Um, and um, it was a very small-time confederation, you know? Like UEFA, the biggest confederation in Europe, makes so much money. There's Champions League taking place this afternoon. Uh, CONCACAF is a much smaller operation, and yet it did grow, and Chuck got a big cut of all of the deals that CONCACAF made. Now, he also did a lot of uh, allegedly shady things over the years, 
uh, taking advantage of his position in CONCACAF, his vote uh, for World Cup hosting. Um, and so he then, once he was approached, uh, began part participating and wore a wire and has eventually pled guilty. And, uh, you know, we'll see what ends up happening with Chuck. He's very sick now and in the hospital. Um, and by cooperating, I think, also thought that that might help him in terms of sentencing. So, and Antonio, if I could ask you, this is, um, the allegations in this indictment span uh, several decades, and the investigation itself, according to the acting U.S. Attorney uh, Kelly Curry out of the Eastern District of New York, itself has been several years. How does one keep an investigation like this covert without the rest of the world knowing about it? And how do you, um, how do you collect information and evidence from abroad uh, in, an, in an international case like this? First of all, how do, how do you keep something covert? I actually think that's perhaps one of the greatest challenges for, for a law enforcement team to keep, to keep uh, investigations covert. I think Grant mentioned that there may have been rumors in of, of an FBI investigation. And if you're on the government side and you have a covert investigation, that's sort of your biggest nightmare because um, the whole point of a covert investigation is that you can get information from witnesses that you would never otherwise be able to get. And so if, you know, and sometimes these investigations grow organically. Sometimes you get breaks that are unanticipated. Sometimes things can start in an entirely serendipitous way. I mean, who knows how Chuck Glazer came to the attention of the U.S. government. You, you can see his charges um, include uh, tax charges. He failed to file tax returns for many years. And that may have been uh, leverage enough over him to get him to become a cooperating witness, to wear a wire, and that kind of evidence is really some of the best evidence you can get. If you can have a cooperating witness who can play the role, which by the way, not every cooperating witness is cut out for that. That's actually a real, uh, a really challenging thing to do, to wear a wire on, uh, on colleagues that you may have worked with over the years, even if they're bribing colleagues. Um, uh, it, is, it can be very tough and challenging, but if you're lucky enough from the government side to get a witness like that who can wear a wire and get recorded conversations on other members of the conspiracy or the RICO conspiracy, uh, it is really some of the best evidence that you can get. And the government, when they, when they have that kind of treasure <laughs> in terms of getting information, and they may have multiple, may, you know, the Eastern District may have had multiple such cooperating witnesses, I really have no idea. Um, you really want to work hard to keep it covert. And so you'll do things and not do things for that very purpose. So for example, you know, in, in the US, you should be able to subpoena certain bank records and require the banking institutions to not disclose the existence of the investigation to the account holders or the customers. Um, you may have more difficulty with foreign institutions. There are certain ways to request, if you're the Department of Justice, there are certain ways to request information um, uh, called MLATs, essentially, to get uh, banking information or other information from, from uh, other entities overseas and so forth. But uh, you may not take that risk because you don't want to jeopardize the possibility of continuing those convert, uh, covert operations or covert conversations. Uh, so there's a lot of factors that go into that. And in fact, you know, to, as Marshall said, um, the Attorney General just came out and said, you know, there may be more charges. You could well imagine a situation where um, they felt constrained before going public with this case from getting certain overseas records or even potentially records in the US and have been diligently getting those records since May 27, now that this thing is, is sort of blown open, and through those additional requests from banks or other institutions or foreign governments that may have come in, uh, they're now building additional charges against other individuals uh, or, or entities, who knows how that's going. But that's uh, it's very much a part of the strategy and the dynamic when you're doing a government investigation like this one. So in the larger case, there's not only um, the cooperator that we've been talking about, Chuck Blazer, but there's also um, a whistleblower in this case. And I'm going to ask one of you to talk to our audience about the distinction in a minute. But I know, Grant, that you have to be at uh, Fox Sports uh, for a big soccer fest It is today. a Champions League Wednesday, so I have to go do the pregame studio show. I have to leave in a second. My apologies. Um, but 
if you want me to talk about yeah, the whistleblower you, that they've spoken to, that? yeah, because um, her name is Phaedra Al Majid, um, and she was originally working for the Qatar bid committee for World Cup 22, and was part of their head of their media operation, and uh, she was let go by the Qataris about a year before the vote took place when things weren't going very well for their bid. Things went much better eventually for them. Um, but uh, Phaedra uh, provided uh, evidence, uh, at least said that she witnessed things, uh, payoffs being promised uh, to World Cup voters, uh, particularly African World Cup voters by the Qatari bid people. Um, and she's gone public with all this. She was on ESPN, a um, uh, piece that they did, a very good one on Seth Blatter not long ago. She actually lives in the, in the Washington, D.C. area now, and, and or she, I, I spoke to her, I can say it now, because she's gone public. I, I spoke to her for three hours in D.C. Um, about a, a month after the bid was won by Qatar. And I, I still think, personally, I. She's a, an interesting source and provided some useful stuff. At the time, she didn't have much in the way of documents that she could provide me, and I'm curious to see how much she actually gets used um, in, this, in this situation. But um, she's uh, certainly a, a figure who was willing to come forward and, and provide information, um, and you know that's a good thing. Thank you so much for being with us today. I know um, that you have more soccer to attend to. Thanks for having me, guys. So Mark, picking up on that um, from your years as a, as a prosecutor, do you have a cooperator and a potential whistleblower? Um, and one of the things that, that Grant did not mention is that um, the whistleblower in this case recanted what she had said um, sometime after and then um, has been, as media reports, has been put into um, protective custody, and she's now said she's given everything over to the FBI. So my question is both about the whistleblower and about the cooperator. How does the government take a witness like that and put them on the stand with the kind of baggage that they ostensibly would have in um, having gone, in Chuck Blazer's case, having committed crimes? and in our whistleblower's case, having recanted and then put forth the story yet again? Um, the fact is that they might not put her on the stand. I mean, it, it, they'll put her on the stand if, if, if I think they can corroborate her and if they need her. Um, we use the term cooperators. What a cooperator basically is, is someone who has firsthand knowledge of a crime and that they themselves were generally involved in, and then they play, plead guilty to their role in the crime and they agree to testify in the grand jury or at trial or do whatever it is that they need to do, including possibly wear a wire, which has been done in this case as well. The, the thing about this case, I think the, the government's really in the catbird seat. They could probably pick and choose who they want to actually put on the stand. Um, they have a lot of ground to cover. The indictment's a sweeping indictment. They're going to need a lot of these historical cooperating witnesses to basically cover all that ground and talk about all these schemes and talk, talk about all the payoffs and all that stuff. But I, I think there's probably no shortage of cooperators in this case. And, and basically what the government will do, and they do this in every case, is they'll, they'll pick their best cooperators, best meaning the ones that cover the most ground and the ones that they think will fare the best on cross-examination. Because, I mean, I'm, I'm the only defense, well, we both, we have two defense attorneys up here. I, keep, I, I had a case with Antonia, so I keep thinking of her, but she's very much a defense lawyer now, too. Um, she beat me to a pulp, <laughs> truthfully. Um, my guy's still in jail because he, <laughs> for a much long, very long time. He'll be in jail when my kids are grown. Um, anyway, that's a diversion. Um, so, so, but back to the point. So the, 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 point, the point being that in any case, you know, you, you, you pick and choose, and you can, um, see who's going to do better on cross-examination. Those are decisions that prosecutors make by actually sitting down for hours and days and speaking to these witnesses and see how they handle themselves. So I don't know that they'll use the whistleblower. I mean, recanting is a big deal. Um, generally, when you 
say something happened and then say something didn't happen, you know, you don't get used by the government unless they're desperate, and they don't really seem desperate in this case. So let's go to the, um, let's go to the jurisdiction issue, because this is an issue that's on a lot of people's mind. For, first of all, um, how is it that the United States has jurisdiction in this case, to bring this case? How can a prosecutor um, in the Eastern District of New York essentially reach across the ocean to the Jack Warners of the world and say, you've committed crimes, you've broken our United States law, and now you will have to come to a United States court and answer uh, for your crimes. How have we established jurisdiction, or how has the government established jurisdiction in this case? Um, well, I'm just going to base this off the indictment, and I think if, if you uh, have a chance, it's an interesting read, uh, both um, from a factual standpoint, as well as um, thinking through some of these issues, uh, like uh, you, you're raising, uh, Serena, of what is the U.S. jurisdiction. And I, th I think what you'll find when you read the indictment um, is that uh, these crimes that are alleged in the indictment, many of them, all of them, took place, at least in part, in ways that touched the United States. So what do I mean by that? If you look at the indictment uh, and you look at the different schemes, you have individuals, defendants, who are U.S. citizens. Not all of them, but some of them. You have others that are lawful permanent residents of the United States. You have others who own property in the United States. And you have companies, key companies like Traffic USA, which comes up again and again as one of the sports, sports marketing firms which was most integrally involved in the bribery schemes, a U.S. corporation. Um, so you have a lot of the entities and people involved in the case actually being U.S. people and U.S. entities. Um, then you have a lot of the conduct that actually took place in the United States. You have meetings in the United States. You have telephone calls where one person uh, was in the United States. Um, you have banking transactions where everybody involved in the transaction knows that the money is flowing through the United States. Um, and so uh, when you add those things up, you even uh, with respect to one largely extraterritorial dispute uh, about um, the, uh, the cup that takes place, uh, the Conma Ball South American Regional Cup uh, between their national teams in South America, when they decide how they want to resolve a dispute over the marketing contract, they, they, their choice of law is Florida state law. So you have the people involved in disputes over the transactions deciding that when they want their legal disputes resolved, they want them resolved in the United States. So you have all of these ways that the folks involved in, these crimi in the criminal activity alleged in the indictment allegedly were themselves availing themselves of the United States. And so when you have, even if conduct is international in nature, when that conduct repeatedly touches the United States, uh, U.S. law um, has plenty of jurisdiction uh, to br so such that criminal prosecutions can be brought here in the United States. There is a separate issue. That one issue is what law applies, and then the second issue is are the defendants themselves, do they have sufficient context to the United States um, that uh, it's, it's constitutional to bring them to justice uh, in U.S. courts? Um, and again, I think what you'll see if you read the indictment through with respect to uh, the defendants here is each of them have uh, numerous connections to the United States, property, bank accounts, or transactions where they reach into the United States to engage in either legal or allegedly illegal activity. So I, I'll throw this question out to all three of you and see who jumps on it. Is, would it be sufficient um, for the criminal activity to have taken place elsewhere, a bribe to take place in another country between individuals who are not uh, U.S. citizens and for those transactions to have proceeded through uh, United States bank accounts. Would, would that be sufficient to reach overseas and prosecute somebody for a crime that touches the United States? Who wants to go? I mean, th you could certainly um, have jurisdiction in, in cases where wires, uh, you know, money is transferred through the U.S. Um, and uh, it reach in, and we and the government often does in sort of terrorist cases where somebody may never even come into the U.S., um, but some the conduct may affect the U.S. It depends on the statute whether it has extraterritorial reach. Obviously, um, wouldn't be true in in a lot of cases involving securities now, um, following sort of recent Supreme Court decisions. But it, so it depends part on the statute and it depends on the conduct that does touch the U.S. But you certainly can, in the right case, I think should. Um, the U.S. government is, is doing the right thing and by reaching out and uh, prosecuting conduct even where it's overseas. Now, I'm not making a comment on, you know, 
uh, FIFA or in any individuals, because I, I think Marshall's absolutely right. In this case, which obviously had you know very big political impact um, as well, there's a tremendous amount of ties to the U.S. and to New York that are laid out in detail in the indictment. But certainly, I think the government can proceed in certain cases, and then you know it has to decide whether it's in the best interest to exercise. Um, you know, prosecutorial discretion to move forward, it's a resource issue, but there can be very compelling reasons, as has been found in some of the terrorist cases, to move forward even when really the only thing that touches the U.S. is perhaps a wire transfer. If I could just jump off that for a second. Um, there, there are really two areas of law that sort of go side by side. There's sort of, you know, principles of international law and, and sort of the first principle of international law I always think of is territoriality. You know, you have a plot of land and you have laws for that plot of land. Um, territoriality is not the governing principle behind the FIFA indictment. I mean, for some, sometimes it is. Um, but then there's another sort of doctrine, you know, protective jurisdiction. We don't want our country affected by unlawful things going on abroad. So you have principles of international law that, in my opinion, have not really been sufficiently well developed um, in the constitutional realm. I mean, Marshall was talking about the fact that there, is, there are Fifth Amendment limitations on where you can be prosecuted. I mean, for instance, let's say, for instance, South Korea has a statute that says it's illegal anywhere in the world to say anything bad about the South Korean leader, or North Korean leader. I don't want to pick on North Korea because that might be a statute. So South <laughs> Korea. Um, I think there was a movie about this. All right, so, so it's illegal to say anything bad about, about the, the English prime minister anywhere in the world. And, and the legislature says, we're going to have this apply everywhere. Really, I'm going to be sitting here in New York and say something bad about England, and I'm going to be arrested by American authorities and then sent to England to defend myself on that? How is, how is that fair? I mean, that's not the law here. It might be the law there, but it's not the law here. So sometimes I think we, we, we abandon territoriality at our peril. And I think there's reason to feel good about this FIFA indictment. I think it does a lot of really good things. But you kind of tweak things a little bit, and you wonder. Like, let's say the Italians did this. I mean, I'm Italian. I can say that. You know, <laughs> we'd be saying, "Oh, geez, what are the Italians doing now?" You know, they, 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 they've indicted all of these people. You know, none of whom have been to Italy. And would we trust it? You know, we assume people trust the U.S. criminal justice system, and for the most part, they do. Um, and I think we probably earned it. Um, but you know, to, to Serena's question. People in another country talking about giving money, you know, in connection with an event in another country, you know, are they really going to think, well, wait a minute, you know, we could get charged with crimes in Brooklyn, you know, if we do, if we go through with this, we could end up in Brooklyn, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, maybe they do, maybe they don't. So there, there are constitutional limits to sort of how far this can go. That all being said, the constitutional limits come up around terrorism cases. And in terrorism cases, there really are no constitutional limits for all sorts of good reasons. So this is going to be one of the cases, though, where we'll see. The defense attorney is going to make all these arguments. And so we'll see how they do. So let's, let's talk a little bit about what are the United States' interests in bringing this indictment. Um, overall, what, what, what's our main interest in bringing this? Is it for the, the purity of the sport? Is it, is it fair play? Is it that it's affecting um, individuals within our country. Um, what's the U.S. interest in bringing this case here in Brooklyn? Um, well, I think to begin, I think it's, it's uh, a core element of um, U.S. policy that international corruption uh, is a, a grave concern, even a national security concern to the United States. Um, and so I think against that, one should view this indictment, I think, against that backdrop. Um, and when you look at the indictment, I think what you'll see alleged there um, is an international organization, uh, one that really spans the globe uh, through its regional confederations and, and through its own work, FIFA, um, that allegedly, in the indictment, uh, is, is riddled with corruption. Um, it has a huge impact, not only on international soccer, but on the international economy, and a growing one. Um, and uh, it's a uh, organization uh, that is sufficiently powerful and sufficiently far-flung in terms of the different countries that it exists in, um, that 
uh, there was some question in the media, Grant's not here anymore, but he could talk about it, about whether they were sort of above the law. Um, and I think um, it is certainly in the U.S.'s interest to ensure that important or international organizations, particularly important international organizations engaged in illegal conduct that uses the U.S. financial system, uh, that takes place on U.S. soil, um, and that is engaged, that activity affects all kinds of um, activities, including tournaments that take place on U.S. soil. Um, I think it's important uh, that the U.S. Um, stands up and uses its statutes where appropriate and where within constitutional and statutory limits um, to attack that allegedly corrupt conduct. To do otherwise would essentially um, suggest that certain international organizations are essentially above the law. No, I echo all of Marshall's comments, but just also put yourself in a prosecutor's position where you happen to hypothetically come across somebody like Chuck Bla Blazer who has committed crimes, tax crimes or what have you, and comes in and cooperators in order to plead guilty, Mark talked a little bit about this, they have to talk about all the criminal conduct they've committed. And you find out about decades of corruption or history of tremendous bribes to corruption in a very important context. What are you supposed to do, turn away? Because it's uh, potentially an international organization. I mean, I think when you see, and whatever the evidence was that came to the Eastern District of New York, however it came there, but if you, if you were in a position where you got a bunch of, you got sort of credible evidence that there was this enormous corruption scheme going on, you'd want to pursue it for all the policy reasons that Marshall just articulated. Um, and to turn, to turn your back on what crime like that, I think, is just, is not, it, it, it's counterintuitive to prosecutors who are uh, interested in ferreting out crime and uh, prosecuting crime. Yeah, and, and one more thought on this. I think that this is an issue really of growing importance, and I think um, that's because of some obvious things like um, the use of the internet and, the, and, and its widespread nature uh, and the ability of people all over the world um, to engage in all kinds of good and bad activity that reaches well beyond the borders of the country in which they're operating. Um, and you see that in the terrorism cases that, that Mark mentioned. You see it um, in cybercrime cases where you have cybercrime actors uh, in countries where they feel uh, safe to engage uh, pretty openly in, in cyber criminal activities. Um, and so some of our uh, commitment to the concept of territoriality is being um, uh, pushed upon by the ability of folks to engage in extraterritorial crime, international crime, um, and I think you're going to see, whether it's FIFA, whether it's a terrorism case, whether it's a cybercrime case, you're going to see courts, uh, prosecutors, and defense attorneys grappling with these issues of um, which country should be bringing uh, cases against criminal actors who are engaged in activity that affects many countries. Just, I just want to jump off what Marshall just said. Um, I think what's, what's developed in the last few years, I mean, I, it seems like once upon a time it was okay to commit bribery overseas. I mean, it just seems to have been, as long as it wasn't a public official, um, because otherwise you wouldn't really need a, a, a vigorous FCPA, you know, to basically tell companies, you know, you can't commit bribery in the United States, but you can't commit bribery there either. Um, and the UK has a similar statute. I think what happened in FIFA is I think payoffs were just part of the game all along, and I think the world changed from under it. I mean, one of the things that I noticed in reading the indictment, it's, it's interesting. At one point, they, they refer to the uh, FIFA Code of Ethics, and I think it's only in 2009 are FIFA officials obligated to have a fiduciary duty to FIFA. So does that mean that before, so what were they doing before 2009? I mean, and, and the answer, and it's funny because I prosecuted the International Boxing Federation. Surprise, surprise, all of the ratings that the IBF did were all based on bribes. I know you're all shocked. I mean, and so we prosecuted Bob Lee, and one of the defenses in the Lee case is he created the IBF, he can rate fighters any way he wants. And it was really an interesting argument and, and if there weren't uh, a, a code of conduct that Bob Lee, for whatever reason, I don't know why he did it, instituted for the IBF, it might not have been a bribe. I mean, because at the end of the day, he says, okay, this is the second best fighter in the world. That's what I think. Maybe I think it because Don King gave me $10,000, but that influenced my thinking. And, and so you, you, it, someone has to say it because it, it really is a wonderful indictment, and I think what I'm about to say is not going to carry the day, but no one's a public official. 
no one has taken an oath of office. If they want to give you know, a soccer match to Qatar over the United States, big deal, big deal. I mean, isn't this why this whole thing started anyway? You know, we got outbid by Qatar, so now we start a big you know, investigation. How, how could that happen? We're a better country than them. I mean, how could this happen? You know, I mean, so, so what? You know, wh wh why can't they do this? I mean, does anyone think, I mean, am I alone in this? Yes. <laughs> See, so my client's still in jail <laughs> all these years later. And so, so there are codes of ethics here. Um, so, so what is it, what is the reason, what's the international um, arena's interest in making sure that the sports marketing is on the up and up, that the World Cup bids are on the up and up, that the, that the um, election of the FIFA president is not, uh, is on the up and up, that people are not getting bribed for this. What's, what's in it for the United States and for the international arena to keep it clean? Well, I mean, that's, that's a fairly fundamental question, I guess, that gets back to um, does the U.S. have an interest in ensuring um, level playing fields for companies uh, across the world, uh, ensuring that uh, important, that, that nation states and international organizations um, don't become sort of a cesspool of corruption and thus allow uh, corrupt actors um, bases from which to uh, make money, um, uh, affect um, international decisions and activities um, affect um, the decisions of foreign governments and, and important foreign organizations. I think um, that at least the U.S. position, and I think it's the right one, uh, is that we do have an interest in implementing our laws in a way to ensure that there is a level playing field um, for all of those engaged uh, in um, uh, international business competition, uh, and that, um, that bribery uh, and corruption, particularly on the scale that's alleged in the indictment, um, fundally, fu f fundamentally undermines the principles which we think should govern um, international transactions uh, and the relationship between governments. Um, that, but that's a, that's a fundamental decision. There are folks, there are certainly folks who have been critical, for example, of the FCPA um, and have said, hey, uh, why should we be hamstringing our companies from competing um, in, cu in countries where there is a culture of corruption? Uh, we should allow our, our you know, sort of, um, if that's the way business is done in X country, then our businesses should be able to engage in that. Uh, and, and, and other businesses that are associated, that are issuers of the, uh, in the United States or otherwise um, uh, has a relationship with the United States such that they should be governed by U.S. law. Um, there, that is a viewpoint. It's not, it's not the U.S. government's viewpoint. Um, I, look, I think at the end of the day, codes of ethics are important. Uh, for companies, but it doesn't mean that if there is no code of ethics, then crime is good and we can all engage in it. Uh, codes of ethics, uh, there are other ways that you can establish fiduciary duties besides the uh, code of ethics at a corporation. So was there another place that this indictment could have been brought? Is the United States, this is sort of a multi-part question, is the United States the only place that this kind of a case could have been brought? And when the United States has been criticized in part and has, has acted as the, United, the world policeman and has been criticized abroad for that, are we now the, the world's arbiter? Are we now the world's court system? Or, or are other countries actually behind us on this and, and participating in both um, this indictment and additional investigations? Well, I, I think the Attorney General has spoken on this um, a couple times at the initial press conference and I think earlier this week. Um, and I think it was uh, significant that she spoke about the um, prosecution uh, at the International Association of Prosecutors meeting in Switzerland um, this week. Uh, because I think, and, and I'm, I have no inside information, but I have no doubt that that was a carefully uh, thought out decision. Um, that is, it, the purpose of it, as, as she discussed in her comments was to highlight the fact that this was not the U.S. Um, out alone trying to be the world policeman, but rather um, this was uh, a, a international effort. Um, the Swiss authorities uh, have announced not only that they've been cooperating and working with U.S. authorities, but have announced their own investigation uh, into the 2018 and 2022 uh, awarding of the World Cup uh, to Russia and Qatar. Um, um, and also, 
uh, I believe both, uh, well, I believe the Attorney General has spoken also about the assistance without naming names of many, many, many countries uh, in the effort and the U.S. government's effort to provide uh, information um, and share uh, the product of U.S. investigation with those other countries. So I don't think what you see here is the U.S. trying on its own to establish itself as the world policeman. I think what you see in the indictment uh, is the U.S. using uh, its effective legal system um, to ensure accountability from an important international organization that allegedly was engaged in very significant corrupt activities, um, but also working very closely with international partners to ensure that those partners bring whatever cases are appropriate under their law uh, and that the uh, community of uh, like-minded prosecutors and governments that care about international corruption issues work together um, to combat uh, uh, this kind of international corruption. So one of the most interesting things to me in reviewing the indictment and, and watching the press conference is that FIFA was um, portrayed as a victim in this case. It, it's both in the indictment and uh, the acting United States attorney uh, for the Eastern District of New York, Curry, um, said that FIFA was a victim in this case. So, Antonia, to you, what's the difference between FIFA and the individuals who acted um, in connection with this case and uh, an SAC Capital case where the corporation is itself the defendant? Well, there's a number of differences, but let's, I mean, if you start from basic principles, if you take uh, SAC Capital, an entity, a corporation can only be liable uh, through the acts of its agents, essentially the employees. So SAC Capital was charged with insider trading and the basis uh, for that charge ultimately was the fact that there were six former portfolio managers and analysts who were in the business of trading who had pled guilty to insider trading and there were also two additional charges, uh, individuals charged with c committing insider trading and who were convicted at trial. And so um, that was an entity that could be liable for the acts of uh, its portfolio managers and agents um, and analysts under the principles of respondeat superior. In other words, the agent um, commits an offense uh, for the benefit of the entity, the corporation, SAC Capital, and within the scope of the agent's uh, job or authority, essentially. And, you know, SAC Capital was in the business of trading in securities markets, and the fact that these employees committed a crime by insider trading doesn't take it outside the scope of authority. It's still conduct within the scope of authority that can be attributed to the company. Uh, and then the question is, you know, the Justice Department then has a whole series of guidelines when it decides to charge a particular entity as to whether or not it'll proceed against an entity um, in any a particular case, in part because it's a little bit akin to strict liability to hold a corporation liable for the acts of its agents. Um, here, uh, it's an interesting, for if you look at FIFA, uh, as you've stated, they're, they're made out to be a victim, essentially. If you look at the charges, um, individuals are charged with uh, honest services fraud. They haven't given honest services to FIFA, essentially. Uh, the, the whole concept is that, that FIFA is the victim of this bribery scheme, or the RICO scheme, which charges, among other things, commercial bribery. And so it's hard to see that, that these people uh, that there, these acts of these individuals would necessarily be attributed to the entity for purposes of essentially entity liability. It's a possibility, but it's, it, that flavor of the indictment is much more akin to FIFA being a victim and therefore the, the, n these individuals acting not within the scope of their authority. I mean, that seems to be the flavor of the indictment. And so that's presumably why they proceeded in the fashion that they proceeded. It's sort of an interesting question at the end of the day because the movement on the corporate side is definitely towards more individuals, charging individuals rather than corporations. And here, the, you know, the Justice Department has done an amazing job of charging a lot of individuals um, and then the question is asked, well, why haven't you charged the entities? Which is normally the reverse of what's being asked on the corporate side today. J just one more thought on that. I think that echoes uh, what Antonia is saying, which is the purpose of SAC Capital, right, was to make money for the people who run SAC Capital as well as the people who invested in SAC right. Capital. And what the traders were engaged in was figuring out an illegal way to make more money and promote the objective of the right. organization. Here, at least arguably, a again, as alleged in the indictment, the purpose of FIFA is not to make money for the people on the board uh, and the executive committee uh, and its leadership. The purpose of FIFA is to regulate and promote the sport uh, and to do other things like invest in its future and things along those lines. So the the 
the efforts of the leadership of FIFA, as alleged in the indictment, to sort of siphon off money to themselves, um, it's hard to see how that would really benefit FIFA as described, a, a, as its um, uh, objectives are described. Right. I mean, in SAC Capital, the portfolio managers and analysts traded SAC Capital's money, and when they made insider trades, the profits went to SAC Capital. The individuals also got a cut of the profits, but it was definitely for the benefit of the corporation. So um, before I ask our final question, I'm actually going to take a few questions from the audience, if there are any, for our panelists. Yes, sir. Okay. Somebody just showed up with a microphone. Uh, I'm Dan Altman from the Stern School. Uh, there are about 80, maybe more organizations that are not government organizations but are covered by FCPA. Um, and they range from the International Committee for the Red Cross to the International Cotton Advisory Committee, the coffee organization. I mean, there are tons of them. Why are there no places on that list for FIFA, the International Olympic Committee, other such organizations? I, I think they have to be specified, and FIFA hasn't been specified as to why. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't have an answer to that. I don't know if anyone else does. Yes. We have somebody in the back if you have a microphone there. Thank you. Uh, my question is about the c cooperation of the uh, Swiss uh, uh, prosecutors, because I'm wondering that the decision was taken, the uh, indictment is in New York, but enforcement has been done in Switzerland. So I was wondering, that's very interesting, there must be a treaty or something and how that collaboration worked. And I think that emphasizes the, the aspect that the US is not alone on this. Right, great, thank you. Um, so this gets into the question of extradition. Um, uh, and uh, so when the individuals were arrested in Switzerland, um, Grant described how that took place at um, a uh, coming together of FIFA officials for a FIFA conference, which took place in Zurich where they're headquartered. Um, and yes, uh, the arrests that took place in Switzerland were arrests on U.S. charges, but they were, um, the U.S. essentially asked Switzerland to make those arrests on its behalf pursuant to the treaty between Switzerland and the United States. So when overseas arrests happen, virtually all the time they happen in connection uh, with a treaty uh, between the United States and its foreign partner that governs extradition, arrest and extradition uh, on U.S. charges overseas. And there are reciprocal um, uh, duties for the United States to do the same if, there were, if, for example, in this case, Switzerland asked for the arrest of U.S. Uh, citizens or U.S. people in the United States um, and then their extradition overseas. So extraditions essentially take place pursuant to a treaty. Um, and there are really two phases. There's a judicial phase and there's an executive phase. The judicial phase involves the forwarding of the arrest warrant, uh, the charging documents, and some... Uh, affidavits or other descriptions of the charges and the evidence that supports them. Um, the judiciary of the foreign country, in this case Switzerland, uh, reviews those, uh, the charges and whatever other information they're given and makes a determination as to whether it's legally sufficient. Once uh, the Swiss uh, courts make a determination that uh, the extradition package that's been forwarded by the U.S. government is legally sufficient, uh, they would, it would then go to the executive phase and the executive uh, in Switzerland um, I'm not sure quite what minister that would be, perhaps the Minister of Justice or something along those lines, would make a determination as to whether effect, to effectuate the surrender of that individual who had been arrested on the U.S. charges to the United States. Um, all of that is pursuant to Swiss law uh, and the treaty um, that uh, the U.S. and Switzerland entered into. And there are different treaties with, all, with, with mo most of uh, the countries, or many of the countries of the world. Um, there are other ways that uh, folks can be sent to the United States to face charges. They can be deported from the foreign country if they had no right to be there in the first place. There are other ways that it can happen. But that is the standard way. That's what's happening, uh, at least according to reports in this case. Um, and at least one of the, the defendants charged in Switzerland decided to waive extradition, which is the right of the defendant in the foreign country to say, I'm not going to contest extradition. But, but other uh, defendants in Switzerland and in other countries for those who were not in Switzerland at the event where the arrests took place, uh, who have been arrested in their countries, they're in the extradition process. And, and one thing to know about the extradition process 
uh, is it takes a long time. It takes months, sometimes even years, for uh, both the judicial and the executive phases of the extradition to be um, uh, executed. Um, those treaties are called multilateral assistance treaties. We have them with a lot of um, with a lot of governments in a lot of countries, but not with all of the countries. Uh, so there are some instances where we actually can't um, seek the extradition of somebody who's in a country that we cannot reach. Do we have another question? And, and one more thought on that. Some countries also, even where we do have treaties, even where we do have extradition treaties, uh, have exceptions, such as uh, for the citizens of, of their own country. Some countries won't extradite their own citizens to the United States. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm uh, Remo de Curtins. I'm actually from Switzerland. So I'm enrolled in the LLM program, and I'm following this US investigation very closely and very interested, obviously from a Swiss perspective. Mainly, uh, I thank you very much for this very interesting insight in the US perspective. Uh, I, I can say that in, also in Switzerland, people really think that something has to be done, that uh, FIFA um, is corrupted to a certain extent, and I guess people are happy that something is done. They're not necessarily happy that the US is doing it and not our own legal enforcement, but we're, at least someone is doing something. That's, that's probably the overall approach. Uh, Mr. Blatter, the FIFA president, is not indicted uh, at, at the moment, uh, I guess. Uh, so what is your expectation? you see any possibility that he will be indicted at a later stage as well? Um, how this, will this evolve? So, so the question is um, whether or not uh, the FIFA president, uh, Sepp Blatter, who actually did indicate that he was going to resign, um, whether or not any of you think that there could be um, charges brought against him. And I think you probably can't answer Yeah, I can't, I can't comment other than to say <laughs> what the Attorney General said earlier this week, which is that she thinks additional individuals and entities will be charged, but n no further specifics were given, and I, I can't imagine anyone really could give any more specifics or I would. Mean, as a general matter, this case will probably proceed like most multiple defendant cases. The, the, the government will try to get cooperation from some of the defendants that had arrested. Um, and I'm sure the first thing that the government's going to want to know is, you know, about the FIFA president. I mean, so um, it might just be a matter of if, if they can get the cooperation that they want. Obviously, he's the target, in my opinion, ultimately. Um, if anyone knows firsthand information of his involvement in corruption, um, they would probably get a suitably good deal uh, by trading that information for the FIFA president. So, but that's a great unknown. So when you started going down that road, I thought you were going to give your phone number and say, please contact me at Brofman and Associates. I mean, I think he's completely innocent myself, but, um, <laughs> that's, but I have no inside information. So um, can we take a really quick final question? Yes, Susan Emenegger, also from Switzerland. So we have two Swiss speaking on this, been also following this. And uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. There's one thing I, I would like to, to add, and that's the following. We've been talking about jurisdiction and extraterritoriality. And um, I thought it was interesting w when you said, well, if you're a prosecutor and you know about this corruption somewhere else, you want to act. And, and my sort of spontaneous reaction was, is I call the other prosecutor. So... Um, that may be something that the U.S. might think about in a broader context because even though in FIFA uh, they have a lot of support, I think that reciprocity w will be a big issue uh, in, in many cases uh, to really fight, be it corruption or, or just criminal practices. And, and if the world doesn't see it coming, then it, it will stop along the lines. And as to Sepp Blatter, well, he will not be extradited for sure because he's Swiss, so... If he stays in his country, he will stay there, but he may go to jail there. I, I might say it might be more agreeable to be in jail in Switzerland than, than in the U.S., but maybe I'm wrong. Definitely. So well, well, just one thought on that, which is that um, I think what you did see uh, on the day that the charges were unveiled was uh, coordinated action on behalf of the Swiss government and the U.S. government. What you saw early, earlier this week, again, was a joint press conference with the Swiss prosecutor and the Attorney General of the United States. Um, so I take your point, um, but, you know, different countries, uh, you know, I think different countries need to affect their own laws um, and need to ensure that uh, the, they are taking the actions that are appropriate under their law and with appropriate coordination um, with other players in the field. And I think, you know, we'll see how the, the FIFA case continues to develop, but 
you know, at least as, as it's played out so far, I think you've seen a lot of coordination between the, the, the different governments. So this, um, this indictment has been applauded um, by many, but there are also those who are not applauding it. Um, it's a rare instance that uh, President Putin um, makes a, comes out and speaks against an indictment that happened in Brooklyn. So not everybody's in agreement. Putin and Agnipolo are the two who are yeah, against it. Yeah, it's just me and Putin, I think. So I told you I wasn't alone. Uh, so what are the what are the lasting implications of this um, of this indictment? What will we see five years from now, ten years from now? What will this? How will this have indictment have changed the world, if at all? Well, it's a bit hard to know how it's going to change the world. I think if it has, uh, it could have potential for positive effect of if there's corruption in other sports uh, institutions uh, around the world, maybe people will uh, be a little more tuned to it and, and move if they have the evidence. That would be, I think, a great result if uh, the indictment had that effect. You shouldn't, certainly couldn't get a greater deterrent effect for more, there's no case with greater publicity for, for, to affect deterrence, so that would also be a good effect. What do you think, Marshall? Well, uh, you know, coming back again to what our, our two commenters from Switzerland talked about, I, I think what I'd like to, uh, hope would come out of this indictment was um, a continued commitment um, in the U.S., but also uh, with many of our allies to rooting out international corruption, um, international corruption uh, in uh, when, when it takes place um, or when uh, public officials overseas engage in international corruption that affects uh, our country such that our companies or our individuals are engaged in that corruption. Um, you can't, the U.S. can't uh, fight and uh, make an impact on international corruption by itself. That's why you have things like um, the OECD, uh, which brings countries together to uh, fight international corruption and share international corruption efforts. Um, that's why I think this this uh, FIFA case can be groundbreaking in ensuring that the average person uh, who's a soccer fan, um, who may otherwise not have a lot of connection to issues of international corruption, can can understand what the fight is all about, why these countries across the world are coming together and trying to work together to root it out, and how it can have an impact on everyday lives um, uh, in, in a way that, uh, that understanding that there's corruption in some far off country is harder to put, wrap your arms around. Um, so I think, to my mind, uh, if, if this case has an impact on uh, international organizations, uh, knowing that, that there are uh, law enforcement folks in various countries who are watching them and are ready to act, um, and also on everyday people and countries across the world uh, and, and increasing their commitment to the fight against international corruption. That would be, um, you know, a hope for what could come out of this. What do you think, Mark? Um, I, I think it's interesting that two of the questions came from uh, people from Switzerland. I mean, because, and I, I say that because I, I spent a lot of time in Switzerland. I represent a number of Swiss banks, and I, never, I represent a number of Swiss bankers. And, um, and the feeling in Switzerland in connection with that investigation is that the U.S. is overreaching and overreaching badly. Um, I think the FIFA indictment is actually quite different. I think the FIFA, I think the, the, the conduct was so reprehensible. I mean, I was, being, I was just being an advocate when I was, like, siding with Putin there. I mean, the, the truth is... The, the, the level of, of bribery is, is just so great that uh, I think I'm, I'm not surprised that this indictment has brought, you know, um, essentially Switzerland and the United States and other leaders together. Um, but in terms of the future, I, I hope all the defendants get acquitted. Uh, I look forward to going to Qatar to watch the World Cup in 2022 with Mr. Putin. Uh, so there are so many more questions that I want to ask, and this is a fantastic panel. I want to thank you, Antonia Apps, Marshall Miller, Mark Agnifilo. Many thanks to the Millbank Tweed Forum for hosting and, and, uh, and sponsoring this, and many thanks to my group, the Program on Corporate Compliance and Enforcement, Jennifer Arlen and Jeffrey Miller, for uh, co-hosting this event today. Thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed it.